Today, I am going to share my favorite bad movie of all time. And it just so happens to be a Christmas movie. Bitchin' Tom. Thomas Kincaid's Christmas Cottage. I own three copies of this movie. I have the Amazon digital version because sometimes it's just easier to stream it rather than like set up the DVD player. I of course have the DVD that I bought like 10 years ago. And then I forgot that I bought this DVD, panicked because this movie is so important to me and bought a second DVD. I am convinced that one day someone is going to try and erase this movie from existence, and I will not let that happen. Thomas Kincaid's Christmas Cottage, released in 2008, is about one singular Christmas in the life of famous painter Thomas Kincaid. And this movie is made by Thomas Kincaid. And who did he cast to play himself? Jared Padalecki. So we have this guy playing this guy. And remember, he cast himself. He was called the Painter of Light, a nickname he gave to himself. This video is going to be freakishly long because there is just so much to discuss here. First, I want to go really in-depth into the movie and just kind of breaking everything apart, but then I also want to tell you some of the story behind the movie, and since I have the physical DVDs, there is a fun bonus feature that I want to share with you, and it gets real weird. If you're not familiar with Thomas Kincaid's work, just picture a grandmother's house. And this movie shares the supposed moment in Thomas Kincaid's life that inspired him to make the first painting in his iconic style. Thomas Kincaid is also a very controversial man. Kincaid's own life was much darker than the idyllic images that he put on canvas. He's also dead. So let's talk about this movie, and I will have so many interesting details to share about the life and business practices of Thomas Kincaid. By the way, if you want to play a Christmas Cottage drinking game, then take a drink every time they talk about light. Or maybe don't do that, because I care about both you and your liver. The red text on the black background as the bell tolls is so ominous. Okay, first of all, Amazon rated this movie as 16 plus for violence, alcohol use, smoking, foul language, and sexual content. This movie only has like one minor example of each of these things. This movie opens with Jared Padalecki as Thomas Kincaid, and he is sketching a portrait of his fancy big city girlfriend, her name is Hope, as they kind of flirt uncomfortably. I want that shoulder. You want more? There is one thing this movie wants you to know right up front. Thomas Kincaid looks like Jared Padalecki, and he has sex. He 100% definitely has sex, and he needs you to know that. There's narration from Tom setting the scene. The year is 1977, and he and his brother Pat are coming home from college for Christmas in their hometown of Placerville, California. Placerville is up in the foothills of the High Sierra. It's not that far from Berkeley as the crow flies. It was just another world away from me. It's their hometown, uh-huh. You know, you rarely see motorcycle sidecars anymore. The narration just introduces us to the town and the characters. Our neighbor, Mr. Rosa, knew every shred of gossip in town. We don't need subtle character building elements through dialogue or action. This isn't that type of movie. Their mom's neighbor comes by and is basically like, 
hey, uh, your mom isn't going to say anything, but her crap shack of a cottage is pretty much falling down. Then the water pipe froze and burst and... Water damage, huh? She, she didn't tell us. Tom goes to take a meal to Glenn Westman, an artist who just so happened to build a studio next door when Tom was a child, and who ultimately served as Tom's art mentor. And we know all this right off the bat, because the narration just tells us. Having a famous artist next door was like God's finger pointing me toward painting. And now we meet Peter O'Toole as Glenn Westman, and Peter is giving 110% into this performance. Like, he goes so hard in this movie. I can't capture her. Can't paint the loss. My hands won't cooperate. Everyone else is giving Hallmark movie acting, and Peter O'Toole is giving I'm a classically trained Shakespearean actor. Don't reduce art to something that's about the artist. Art isn't about the artist, it's about life. By the way, just so it's clear, this is not a Hallmark movie. Glenn appears to be struggling with both dementia and probably Parkinson's, since he can't really use his hands, and therefore he can't paint like he used to. You must see the summer light in Paris. Because remember, Thomas Kincaid's self-given nickname is Painter of Light. If there were a god, that light would be like his hand. Peter O'Toole is just in an entirely different movie than everyone else. They don't deserve him. It's like, you know that scene in Mean Girls where Katie dresses up as a zombie bride for the Halloween party, and she puts so much effort into her costume, and it looks really good, but when she gets to the party, she looks insane. Because every other girl just wore sexy lingerie and animal ears. That's what's happening here. Peter O'Toole is Lindsay Lohan. A sentence that's never been said before. Also, by the way, Glenn Westman is based on a real man named Glenn Wessels, who was a painter and did mentor Thomas Kincaid. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of information out there about Glenn Wessels. I do know that he was born in South Africa and came to the United States as a child, so he wasn't an Englishman. That night, the crap shack cottage is leaking, and the boys discover that their mom defaulted on her mortgage, and the bank is foreclosing on the house. We're gonna lose the cottage. Tom and Pat can't fall asleep, so Pat tells Tom that when they were kids, he used to fall asleep by looking at this drawing that Tom did of their dad. No, I used to fall asleep. I was looking at that drawing of dad. And I kid you not, the camera cuts to the drawing, and it's a sketch of their dad leaving them back turned, walking out the door with his bags packed, and they hung it on the wall? How did this help you sleep? Anyway, both brothers decide to stay in town over Christmas and try to earn some money to help their mom pay back the bank. Parts of the ceiling fall into their pancakes. Mmm, asbestos. Pat gets a job with just some guy named Big Jim who wants to set up better Christmas lights than his neighbors. And this becomes one of the movie's many, many B-plots. Your move, Big Jim. You're pathetic, Gunderson. I feel like there have got to be better paying holiday jobs than just helping Big Jim be petty. With all the rain they've been having, I feel like this guy shouldn't have just like a standard power strip lying around outdoors. And we see some CGI smoke. Meanwhile, Tom goes to talk to the mayor in the saloon in the middle of the day. That's where their mayor is. Tom wants a job, but the mayor is like, no, 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 no. I'm gonna talk about my B-level plot point about how I wanna make Placerville the Christmas capital of the world to bring in tourists. To the Christmas tree capital of the world. 
Yeah, sounds good. So, sounds good. No, saying. no, no. Tanya, a former Miss Placerville who apparently caused like a stir in the town by posing naked for a magazine called Easy Riders, which I looked up and is a real magazine. It features like naked women with motorcycles. And according to fans of the magazine, it really went downhill in the 80s. Anyway, she wants to be part of the tree lighting, basically so she can get on TV. But no one ever did turn on a tree the way I turned on a tree. Did they? The script for this movie is weird. I'm not some little orphan Ernie. I mean, Annie. Ernie. You know what I mean. I don't. I don't either. And I've seen this movie more times than any other human being, alive or dead. The scene in the bar was so useless that the very next scene is Tom chasing down the mayor in the street to ask him again about a job. Then the purpose of this scene is to show an unfinished mural of the town, which the mayor offers Tom $500 to paint. I used a random online inflation calculator and $500 in 1977 would be about $2,500 in today's money, which feels like kind of a lot for a random mural on the side of a store in what seems like a pretty broke town. The boys pick up their mom from work at an insurance office, and fun fact, the office is named after two of Thomas Kincaid's daughters in real life. Tom calls their dad at the pizza shop where he works, and the dad calls Tom T-Bone. Hi, Dad. T-Bone! How's it hanging, son? Their dad is a guy with some big yet confusing plans. I will watch with glee that public face jerk fall to his knees as the old dad is anointed with the little Joe's pizza crown. Dad, he's 19. We get a sense that Tom feels like painting this small town mural is beneath him and his Berkeley education, but he's still doing a good job. Glenn has a different perspective on the mural. It's your chance to illuminate where you live to inspire your neighbors. Illuminate, as in shine a light upon. You think because they aren't sophisticated they don't deserve your best art? Remember what I said about Peter O'Toole giving 110%? Like, Jared does not even know how to play off of him. He's just like, ah, I've been in Gilmore Girls and maybe like two seasons of Supernatural at this point. Jared doesn't even need to be here. They could just put a scarf on a mop and let Peter O'Toole do whatever he wants. All the king's horses. All the king's men. Glenn recites Humpty Dumpty, seemingly as an allegory for himself. Then his voice fades out, and you can see that he's kind of drooling. But he looks at Tom, and he smiles in recognition. Okay, here's the thing. The scenes with Glenn are so awkward and uncomfortable and unintentionally funny. But... Peter O'Toole is giving an amazing performance. Like, the look on his face is really selling the fact that this character has dementia. The only reason his scenes are kind of ridiculous are because the performance he is giving is so far beyond the energy that Jared Padalecki is giving back to him. Like, the thing that Glenn says about how just because the people in this town are dumb doesn't mean you shouldn't give them, like, your best art. And that is what Peter O'Toole is doing with this movie. This movie is dumb, but he's doing his best. Anyway, the movie makes a point about how Tom's mother, Marianne, is just beloved by the town, and she's always helping random people, like this guy. That war is still taking its toll. Wars never end. Just the lives of the soldiers who fight them. This comes out of nowhere. Like, there is no other war or veteran-related messaging. Just all of a sudden, there's this boldly emotional statement that looks like it should go on a poorly designed Facebook meme that gets shared by, like, that one ant around Memorial Day. The only constant in this movie is that nothing makes sense. Like, in the very next scene, Tom runs into his mom's busybody neighbor, and they have this conversation. I know you think I'm a busybody. 
Am I okay with you? Yeah. What's happening? Is this guy about to, like, jump off a bridge? No. Now the music just picks up in a humorous way while the guy struggles to walk his dog and Tom keeps painting. Practice for the annual church Christmas pageant is going poorly. Big Jim and his neighbor are both wise men and they get in a fight and Big Jim literally tries to strangle his neighbor Homer Simpson style. And it, everyone who witnesses this is just like, hey, stop it. But I don't think this man is safe to be around. Like if people hadn't pulled the two men apart, would Big Jim have just murdered his neighbor in the church? Surrounded by children? The next day, T-Bone and his brother are excited to see their dad. He gives them dirty magazines. Great. That is vintage gold. First class merchandise. Go ahead, go ahead, open them up, don't be bashful. Oh, and he has a nickname for Pat, too. Go ahead, Patty Whacker. I just, I don't know, guys. Like, maybe it's different for men, but I would be weirded out if a parent was like, Merry Christmas! Here's some porn I collected! Let's look at it. That right there, 100% made in America. The dad is also giving a really weird performance. We are going to Mexico. <laughs> Where the beer is cold and the senorita is hot. Boys, we gotta go soon! Ah, ole! It is so high energy that it does not fit with the tone of the rest of this movie. He also tries to touch Tom's crotch, and he gives some sound fatherly advice. All you gotta do is just grab your ass with both hands and never let go. Tom is working on the mural, and now we get my favorite line in the whole movie. Bitchin' Tom. This man sounds like he has never said the word bitchin' before in his life. I love when actors playing artists have to draw on camera and it's just like these vague lines. Uh, fun fact, Thomas Kincaid is left-handed while Jared Padalecki is right-handed, so Jared had to practice using his non-dominant hand for this movie. This guy invites Tom for a walk to go see his son. Would you like to take a walk with me? I'm gonna go see my kid. So now we get the context for that cemetery scene this guy had with Marianne earlier. Um, his son was a soldier who died in Vietnam. But the movie held back on that information because it seems like they wanted it to be a reveal. But why? What purpose does that serve? Like, why not just give the context in that first scene? Why do we have two scenes of this very, very minor character being sad about his dead son? The thing is, sort of like how Peter O'Toole's dementia performance is really good in isolation from the rest of the movie, this guy's story is also really sad, and it could be something meaningful, except it's not part of the main plot, so they never actually do anything with it, so ultimately it just feels pointless and like a waste of time. And just like in the scenes with Glenn, Tom stands there and says nothing while the other person gives this sentimental monologue that's just interspersed with shots of Tom with a sympathetic look on his face. Just a handsome mop. This movie is trying to hit too many emotional beats and it's missing all of them. I think the tone will make more sense when I tell you that while Thomas Kincaid obviously came up with the story because this movie is based on his life, uh, the actual script was written by Ken Lezebnik, who is best known for writing numerous episodes of Touched by an Angel. So yeah, that tracks. Marianne goes to see Bill, the, the dad at the saloon. Still killing time, huh, Bill? No one ever kills time, honey. You can hold it captive. Every character delivers their lines like they think it's going to be in the trailer. The trailer for a different movie that's about their character. I've never asked you for anything. 
ever. Marianne swallows her pride and asks him for a favor. I need you to perform in the pageant. Oh, Nellie. But not for money. To save her house, she asks him to be a wise man in the Christmas pageant. She is using every bit of leverage that she's got from their failed marriage to get him to be in this play. I don't owe anybody anything. Oh, you do. You owe me. Girl, I'm sure this town is full of adult men who can stand still and wear a beard. Okay, back to Glenn, who is trying to paint, but he's struggling. And I'm not sure if he's crying or drooling, but it's just too real for this movie. Stop doing such a good job, Peter. Glenn's art buyer, played by Ed Asner, comes to see if Glenn has anything new to sell. I need a great painting. He needs a great check. But Glenn insists that he is done painting. I'm through with the whole business. I'm done. I'm finished. He talks about his staff. His rod. I want my staff, my rod, staff, rod. Do you please bring me my staff, my rod? I looked it up, and this is what Glenn Wessel's paintings actually looked like in real life. Um, it's been a while since he died, and obviously he lived before the age of the internet, so I can't really tell if he was a popular artist during his time. Tom shows the art dealer guy his own work, it's only like three paintings, and he asks if he could sell it. And the guy's like, no, it's not very good. I don't think so. Your teachers at Berkeley do this kind of thing better. These are pale imitations. Tom's painting his mural and his old girlfriend, Nanette, shows up out of nowhere to offer sudden and overly sincere encouragement. It's beautiful, Tom. Don't ever doubt that. So now we get a montage of all the B-plots. We've got Big Jim and the Christmas lights, Marianne helping people around the town, the Christmas pageant, the whole tree thing, Tom working on the mural, and the sheriff delivering foreclosure paperwork to Marianne. It's important to point out that Tom is painting the decorations for the Christmas pageant. The boys count their earnings, but it won't be enough. Hope calls out of nowhere, pretty much just to remind us that Tom has a hot girlfriend. I miss you so much, Thomas. Yes, the scenes in this movie just jump from one another in a way that feels sudden and disconnected. T-Bone goes to see his dad at the saloon. Tom asks his dad for money, but the dad is broke. Number one, son. I ain't got it. We can see that the dad must have like a sexy lady tattoo on his arm, but we can only see the one leg, so I like to imagine that it's the leg lamp from A Christmas Story, which didn't come out till 1983, and this movie is set in 1977, so the dad is a time traveler, and that's what scrambled his brain. Tom goes home and looks at the drawing of his dad leaving them. Why is that still hanging on the wall of your childhood bedroom? The next day, Tom drops his mom off at work, but as he's driving away, he looks back and sees that she doesn't go into the office and instead plans to sit on a bench for eight hours. I got laid off in September. She says that she's looking for work, but there's nothing. And like, okay, I can guess that in this small town, there might not be something that pays as well as her office job, but she is literally about to lose her house and is spending her days just like sitting on a bench. I mean, at least get a job in a store or in the saloon so you have money coming in. You have so many friends here in town, they'll help. I'll go talk to everybody no. in town. No, you won't. Tom wants to ask around town for help, but Mary Ann refuses. Mary Ann Kincaid does not ask for charity. Ride goeth before the fall, Mary Ann. Proverbs 16, 18, Mary Ann. I looked up what Bible passage that was just for this video, Mary Ann. Hope shows up. She's just here now. There's no point. The tree lighting ends up going poorly. Marianne goes to see Glenn, but he's trapped in the memories of his dead wife, Nicole. We're not in Paris. 
or in your studio? My studio. My easel, my paints. They're all here. You go. I cannot get over how well he's doing the dementia eyes. Like, it makes me legitimately sad. So I go from feeling real human feelings in this scene to the next scene where the Christmas pageant decorations literally begin melting and it looks like the stable animals are peeing. Because Tom used wax-based paint and the TV lights are just too hot. Oh my god. We must have used too much wax. The mayor publicly and specifically blames Tom, just pointing fingers at him right in the middle of the church. Well, Tommy, you painted the scenery. You're the one that screwed up. No, no, whoa. Then the dad steps in because apparently he agreed to be in the pageant and actually showed up. And then he gives a little speech. This old town. You don't need to impress anyone. You're a okay, just the way you are. Where did that little speech come from? What aspect of his character makes it seem like he would be like capable of giving an inspiring little Christmas speech? Are we all here celebrating someone who was born in a garage? And Hope is just like, this is too depressing. I'm out. Don't give up. I think it's somehow silently understood that their relationship is over. Why? I don't know. But now they have a nice candlelit church service. You are the light of the world, a very dark winter. And we could all use a little bit of extra light right now. This gives Tom the inspiration that he needed. So as the snow falls and the parishioners exit the church, they pass by the mural and see that it's done. And yes, we need to go shot by shot through every single person in the cast and their face in the painting. It takes forever. Tanya in the mural looks terrible. Like she looks 30 years older. Like Tom could have gotten a photo of her. I'm sure his dad has one. We can see that Tom added warm glowing lights to the windows and the street lamps in what would later become Thomas Kincaid's signature commercial style. The moral of the story is, if you sell out your artistic principles, you can make money. Tom goes to see Glenn, who is alone and seemingly catatonic. This man needs full-time care, but he's apparently living by himself in an unheated art studio. This plotline stresses me out so much. So now we have what is supposed to be the emotional climax of the movie, where the handsome mop delivers his own monologue to Glenn. I always thought it was a miracle when you built your studio in the field by my house. I wish I could give you back something, but I have nothing. This may be our last Christmas together, and I have no gift for you, Glenn. Jared Padalecki has to summon some tears. He's got to summon a lot of tears. His face is just twitching like crazy. I feel like Jared got better at crying over the course of Supernatural. Although he sure did get a lot of practice on that show. Don't give up, Glenn. There's a light in you still. Part of me just wants to be like, let the poor man die. But his impassioned speech and seemingly the light of the candle break Glenn out of his fog. And Glenn begins to paint. He's very intent and focused, and maybe a little crazy. The next day, they're celebrating Christmas when there's a knock at the door, and it's the townsfolk. They've all come to help Marianne fix up the house. Well, all the townsfolk and these random guys in the back. Who are these guys? What weird and tragic backstory do they have? So these people with presumably no handyman or construction skills all work on the Christmas cottage. The mayor hurts himself the same way twice, working on the gutter. I think it's the exact same shot. Let's compare. <laughs> like, I don't know what these people are doing. It looks like they're cleaning or painting the exterior. Um, I'm pretty sure that the problem is that the roof needs to be repaired. And with how much it's been raining and how badly the roof's been leaking, I'm pretty sure there's some sort of water damage. So... You guys, you guys gonna fix the roof? No? 
So the main structure of the house is going to crumble, but at least these exterior door handles will look clean. Like, look at this old lady. They show her hammering way too cheerfully. And then we see her in the background just like vacantly waving a hammer around a random nail in the porch railing. Later, Tom is sharpening a knife for some reason when there's a knock on the door and Glenn shows up. How'd you get over here? My staff. I rocked. Paint the light. I'm going to say light several more times, Tom. It's the light, Tom. The light lasts forever. No, I'm not done yet. Paint the light. The painting is both pretty and also looks like something that you could buy on sale at Home Goods. The last leaf is my last painting, Tom. The name of the painting is Ultimum Folium, and I looked it up to see if this was a real painting, and no, it's not. This is not a real painting. I remember, Glenn Wessel's art style looked like this. It was very different. More talk about light. Not darkness, but light. I was painting the leaves of the forest. I never saw the light of the sky behind it. At this point, if you decided to play the drinking game, you're probably seeing the light at the end of a very long, dark tunnel. Don't go to it! Come back! Follow the sound of my voice. Tom's like, I'll treasure it forever. No, you will not. You will take it to Sidney Marvin and you will sell it. The last Glen Westman should bring you enough to keep this cottage forever. It should apparently get them a lot of money. But according to this one auction site, um, the real Glenn Wessel's artwork is only valued at like a couple hundred dollars. So... Unfortunately, Glenn's condition immediately begins to deteriorate. And then they have him stay for Christmas dinner. And it is so awkward, because he is not in good shape. And he just smiles vacantly at everyone around the table. Like, Peter O'Toole's painfully accurate dementia performance, juxtaposed against the made-for-TV quality that everyone else is bringing, just makes me so viscerally uncomfortable. I don't know if doing your best is the right thing in every circumstance. Like, I would have felt better if he had just given me 90s ABC sitcom Alzheimer's, or like the notebook Alzheimer's. Don't bust out realism in Thomas Kincaid's Christmas Cottage. The movie wraps up all its plot lines, but it does it in kind of like a weird way. We see an unnecessary flashback of Tom painting the mural. And Big Jim ends his feud with his neighbors by removing all of his gaudy decorations and just has one simple star atop his house. Glenn dies and apparently Tom found his body. When I went to see Glenn the next evening, he had gone home for good. He was back where the light burns brighter. This plotline does not belong in this movie. The narration now tells us that this all happened 30 years ago, and Big Jim still just puts up a single star. And why are you showing us the exact same scene you just showed us? Oh, and a bunch of other people are dead now, too. Vesta's buried in that little cemetery near our house. Butch is there, too. Apparently, Glenn's painting sold for so much money that Marianne was set for life. Well, she never had to worry about a mortgage payment again. We see Tom walking with Nanette. Nanette? Well, that's a story for another day. Oh, it sure is! And that is a story I will tell you in just a minute. This movie ends with Jared Padalecki's narration over a shot of the real Thomas Kincaid. Lessons about art. About life and about light. Love is the brightest light of all. Two shots down the hatch. Actually, I shouldn't have included the drinking game joke uh, because Thomas Kincaid struggled with alcoholism. So that's actually kind of inappropriate and gauche of me, but it's too late now. The end. No, no, don't you dare end on a photo of Tom and the real Glenn. Listen to me. 
No person wants to be memorialized as they were in the final throes of dementia, no matter how good of a job Peter O'Toole did. If you wanted to make this movie a tribute to Glenn, then it should have been about Glenn. Like, use the dementia as a narrative framework and show flashbacks to the memories that Glenn is getting lost in. Thomas Kincaid could have still been in it. Remember how earlier I said there's not a lot of information out there about the life of Glenn Wessels? Well, wouldn't it be a real good tribute to this guy to actually make a movie? That's about his life. But no, this is the movie that Thomas Kincaid made about himself, played by a handsome mop and a scarf. So, I said I'd tell you more about Tom and Nanette. Tom and Nanette went on to get married on May 2nd, 1982, so four and a half years after the supposed events of this movie. Tom would often hide the numbers 5282 in his paintings as a tribute to her. They also had four lovely daughters, and their family just looked so sweet, so wholesome. So at the time of Thomas Kincaid's death in 2012, his fans were shocked to learn that Nanette had filed for divorce two years prior. However, the divorce had just never been finalized. Except he did move in with his new girlfriend, Amy Pinto. And after Tom died, presumably from a mix of alcohol and Valium, Amy produced two very unconventional handwritten wills in which Tom left everything in his estate to her. Sure, that looks like ink that's on paper. It ended up going to court, Amy versus Nanette, and they ultimately reached an undisclosed settlement outside of court. Tom's alcoholism and his shady business practices tarnished his good Christian reputation in his final years. He'd gotten a DUI, supposedly peed on a statue of Winnie the Pooh at Disney, and allegedly groped a woman's breast, saying the very smooth line of, these are some great tits. It's also been said that he disrupted a Siegfried and Roy show by repeatedly yelling, codpiece, codpiece. He was also apparently accused of committing fraud, and I am not, like, super savvy with business-related things, so I will explain the situation to the best of my understanding. He created a franchise opportunity for individual investors to open their own Thomas Kincaid Signature Gallery locations. Uh, these were individuals who paid merchandising fees, and also purchased all the product to resell at their location. Thomas Kincaid then took his entire business public in the stock market, which came with an inherent payday. And then he allegedly began to undercut the value of his own products so the company would decrease in value and he could buy it back at a cheaper price. Tom used a lot of religious rhetoric about being blessed to convince these people that it was a good investment to take their life savings or their retirement fund and open one of his galleries. And then he made them pay a certain amount for the licensing and then purchase all the products to resell. And then he went and sold all those exact same products somewhere else cheaper so that his company would take a dive, but it also directly impacted the ability of these franchise owners to sell off all the crap they bought. At one point, he was investigated by the FBI, and he did end up losing two arbitrations, and his company had to pay back the lost investments from those gallery owners. Despite the prolific nature of his work, there are many sources that say that there are very few actual Thomas Kincaid paintings out there. And a lot of what were sold as paintings were actually high quality prints that either Tom or one of his studio assistants touched up with a paintbrush. I found a couple of cases where senior citizens needed to like downsize and sell off their artwork, and they were shocked to discover that their Thomas Kincaid paintings one, potentially aren't original paintings like they thought, and two, are absolutely worthless because the market is so saturated. Despite Thomas Kincaid being dead, artwork is still being created and sold by Thomas Kincaid Studios. This is art that is developed either digitally or by hand in the style of Thomas Kincaid. So some people may purchase these works thinking they're by Thomas Kincaid, 
but they're not. So this painting of a cottage, Thomas Kincaid. This painting of Obi-Wan fighting Vader in A New Hope, Thomas Kincaid Studios. Since I own this movie on DVD, I wanted to pull one of the behind the scenes featurettes to share with you. If you rent this movie on Amazon, you're not gonna get to see it. It's titled, On the Set with Extra Ed Acknick. We meet Ed, who is supposedly a biker and an extra in the movie. I'm Ed Acknick, I'm from Chicago originally. He's not really into paintings though. I'm not in art, yeah, you know what? Who wants a painting of a cottage? If I want a painting, I wanted a painting of a chick. He harangues the production team. I, I'm, I'm hey, 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 you know, I'm gonna remember this, man. I, I, I'm gonna remember this. He manhandles the props. This piece of equipment is very valuable. I'm not sure what it does. He talks about a correspondence course that he took in filmmaking. But I took a correspondence course on filmmaking, but I did take a course. I, got, I, I took a correspondence course. For them to cut me off this project like that after I took that correspondence course, I mean, you know. They pretend to have him escorted off the set. Come well, on, you should not do on. that. I'm gonna have to. I'm... Ed Acknick is Kincaid backwards. This is Thomas Kincaid. Well, even though I'm a biker, I'm a sensitive guy. I can't help but recall that the magazine that they picked to have had Tanya pose naked for uh, was Easy Riders, which is a sexy lady motorcycle magazine. And Thomas Kincaid chose to dress as a biker. So there's a theme here. They should have had him look at her centerfold and be like, those are some great tits. And that's Thomas Kincaid's Christmas Cottage. I watch it every year. And now since this video exists, they can never fully erase this movie. Also, yes, the movie Christmas Lodge, starring a post-Stargate Michael Shanks, is in fact on my radar. I have watched it several times. Um, right now, at time of filming, I think it is available for streaming for free if you have Amazon Prime, but like, don't quote me on that because sometimes things change. Um, that one, is a Thomas Kincaid movie, but it does not have Thomas Kincaid as a character. So that just kind of makes it a little bit more of your run-of-the-mill cheesy Christmas movie, rather than whatever you would classify this as.